His crimes against children shocked the world. He's someone who likes to hurt, to hurt mentally, to hurt physically. His arrest sparked protests that brought his home country, Belgium, to the brink of revolution. We were just informed that as from today you stop your investigation. And that was it. His dark past fuels conspiracy theories to this day. There was a sense of total disbelief, a sense of revolt. This is the shocking story of the monster of Belgium. Who was he? How was he able to kidnap, rape and murder young children right under the noses of the police in this modern European country? Was he protected? Or did he benefit from a catalogue of police mistakes? I don't believe that there is one person in this country who knows the full story. In August 1995, 17-year-old Anne Marshall and her 19-year-old friend Jeffje Lambrex go on a camping holiday with a group of friends to Blonkenbecher on Belgium's North Sea coast, despite the reservations of Anne's father, Paul. This was her first time on holiday without any parents. We talked about this with her and she said, Dad, I'm turning 18. And then my wife too said, well, we'll have to let her go sometime. During their holiday, Anne and Effie attend a hypnotist show. Whilst on stage, they're filmed by a member of the audience. Later that night, Anne's father receives a disturbing call. We received a phone call from one of the friends who told us that Anne and Effie had not returned from a show they had attended in Blankenburg the previous evening. I was really panicky. Like something's wrong here. This doesn't add up. When Paul Marshall meets the police himself the following day, he's worried by their apparent lack of concern. So I asked, so what are you going to do? Just don't worry, the girls will be back, they probably just went looking for adventure. They will most definitely show up. I was shocked. I had always thought that the police are there to make sure everything works out fine, everything works out safely. Paul Marshall returns home and begins his own campaign to find his daughter. No posters or searches were made, so we were going to do it ourselves. He is not the only parent searching for a missing child that summer in Belgium. Only eight weeks before Anne and Effie disappeared, eight-year-olds Melissa Rousseau and Julie Lejeune had vanished from a park near their home in Grasse-Ologne, over a hundred miles to the south of Blonkenbecher. The police have made little progress in finding them. Journalist Douglas de Koning has written about the impact of Belgium's missing children throughout the 90s. It happened so often that kids disappeared. It seemed like uh, some kind of phenomenon uh, we started to live with. Uh, yeah, that happens every, every summer, some kids disappear. Children that disappeared from one day to another and that left no trace at all. Some politicians like Vincent de Croly are also becoming concerned. A child disappearance was considered a relatively ordinary problem, treated like an ordinary theft. The dominant view within the Belgian police was to simply wait for 48 hours, giving priority to the theory that they had simply run away. But these first hours are critical. Studies show that 91% of abducted children are murdered within 24 hours. In Belgium, on se privait donc de la plupart des chances de gagner. In Belgium, usually during the first hours, the police told the parents, "Thank you, we have written it down, but please come back to see us in a few hours or days." Six months pass, and the girls are not found. The police appear to have no leads and no idea whether they're dead or alive. The frantic parents continue their campaigns, but slowly, hope begins to fade. 
in February. Only in late February of the next year, only then did I start considering it was possible that we were now searching for dead girls. With four girls disappearing without trace, are other children in danger? Some are being watched and stalked. Soon, more young girls will disappear. On a summer's day in 1996, 12-year-old Sabine Dardenne begins her ride to school as usual. Okay, I'm When Sabine goes missing, it becomes Belgium's latest high-profile case that year of a young girl disappearing. In response to growing concern, the authorities establish a missing persons unit to coordinate all the separate investigations. Among the investigators is Albert Prim. We had no clue whatsoever about any known offender. We investigated as many leads as we could, but it really was all negative. We couldn't have believed that one and the same person could be guilty of all these disappearances. That was completely unthinkable, at least at the time. Ten weeks pass, and Sabine's disappearance fades out of the headlines. Then, with investigators still struggling to establish any firm leads, another young girl is targeted. 14-year-old Letitia Delay is walking home from her local swimming pool in Bertry, southern Belgium. She is snatched off the street in broad daylight. With six girls missing, there is strong public pressure to get results. Michel de Moulin, an investigator in the small town of Dinan, is one of the extra police officers drafted in to search for Letitia. Well, on the 9th of August 1996, the day Letitia went missing, I was called upon to participate like other investigators in searches regarding this disappearance since the investigation so far had yielded loads of data that had to be verified. After two or three days of searching, we still hadn't found it this year. But we did have a few statements that seemed interesting to us. One statement came from a local resident who has noticed a suspicious vehicle in the village. We were able to work out some parts of the registration number of the van, a white van. Also a good description of the van. Which allowed us to make a connection with someone who had a potential profile on this kind of thing. The van is registered to a 39-year-old father of three, an unemployed electrician called Marc Dutroux. De Moulin brings Dutroux in for questioning, along with his wife, Michel Martin, and known associate, Michel Lelièvre. I started leading the interrogation of the suspect. I always approach a suspect in the same way, which is to try and make sense of the personality I'm facing. Have you followed the actuality of these last days? I don't know what's going on in Belgium. I don't have the TV. By now, Letitia has been missing for six days. Statistically, her chances of survival are slim. 
With Dutroux not talking, Dumoulin and his team turned to the other two in custody. Michel Lelièvre, a drifter and heroin addict who has been assisting Marc Dutroux, caves in under questioning. He m'a dit, je l'ai vu. Elle a remonté la rue en direction du véhicule. Lorsqu'ils sont arrivés à hauteur de la voiture, la portière était déjà ouverte. Il l'a poussé violemment à l'intérieur. Il a crié une fois. Dutroux's wife, Michel Martin, also confesses and attempts to distance herself from her husband. Je suis honteuse pour me marier. Je suis sidérée par les faits commis par mon mari. J'ai conduit le véhicule jusqu'au Marcinel. Marc est toujours resté à l'arrière près de la fille. Michel Lelièvre's confession means Inspector de Moulin now knows that Dutroux has taken Letitia, but he doesn't know if she's still alive. When you are looking for a victim, you're hoping to find them alive. So you do have to be firm. Nous savons tout, Monsieur Dutroux. Je veux que vous nous portiez à Marcinel et nous montriez ce que vous avez fait avec Laetitia Delay. But he isn't prepared for what happens next. Tu sais quoi? Je peux te donner deux filles. Derrière moi, il y avait effectivement. Behind me, there was a poster about Sabine's disappearance. So when he told me the other ones with her, I just cast a brief glance behind me and I said, "Who? Sabine?" And he said, "Yes." I'm telling you, when I hear this, it still gives me the shudders again. Armed with sensational information of the whereabouts of the two missing girls, investigators rush Dutroux to a house in Charleroi, in which he claims they're imprisoned. Dumoulin's only hope is that the girls are still alive. I was quite sure he had told me the truth, but at the same time I thought it was almost impossible they could be there. In a tiny, filthy dungeon, hidden underneath the house, Dumoulin finds Letitia Delay abducted six days earlier. And, incredibly, Sabine Dardenne, still alive 80 days after disappearing. Both girls are exhausted and terrified. When you discover this kind of thing, you go through all kinds of emotions. You're happy, you're angry, you think it's impossible, you feel revolted. These are visions that linger with you for months afterwards. Under the full glare of the world's media, the two girls see daylight for the first time since their abduction. I recognized Leticia at once, but Sabine. At first, I couldn't really believe it, and I wasn't the only one. The world witnesses heartbreaking scenes of parents reunited with the daughters they feared dead. The kid couldn't stop crying. Dutroux had deceived her into believing that her family didn't care about her anymore, that she had been completely forgotten by her family, that she didn't exist anymore in their eyes. The way these kids looked, it really gave you the chills, even as a policeman. Finding the girls gives Belgium and some desperate parents hope. I was happy for Sabine and for Laetitia and for their parents, their families, for their friends. And at the same time I thought, you see, we still have hope too. But after further questioning, Dutroux leads the police to other missing girls over the following two days. The proceeds of crime and benefit fraud allowed Dutroux to acquire seven houses which offered makeshift dump sites for the young girls he abducted. Julie Lejeune and Melissa Rousseau, two eight-year-old girls who disappeared together in June 1995, are found buried in the back garden of one of his houses. They starve to death 
when he had been in prison for car theft. When the bodies of Julie and Melissa were discovered, a terrible collective emotional shock went through the country. Dutroux had left his wife, Michel Martin, to feed Julie and Melissa, but she claimed she was too afraid to go into the dungeon where they were held. Child psychologist Jean-Yves Ayer spoke out about the case. He felt that Dutroux's wife's personality may have played a part in her husband's horrific crimes. I think Michel Martin was a passive and masochistic woman. And I think she was very afraid of him. To me, she's responsible as well for not having talked, for not having turned him in. Well, she could even have done it anonymously if she was so afraid. But she didn't. Seventeen days after his first confession, Dutroux leads police to a property in the town of Jumet, where investigators discover the bodies of Anne Marshall and F.A. Lambrex, who had disappeared while on holiday more than a year earlier. The girls had been drugged and buried alive. For Paul Marshall, the search for his daughter is over. It was, it was of course very painful. It's hard to accept at that moment. You know they're not suffering anymore. They're not there anymore. And you have to learn to live with it. All six missing girls have now been found. Belgium struggles to come to terms with the tragedy. Throughout the country, there was a lot of distress, a lot of anger, a lot of sadness and incomprehension. The country was facing evil and the slaughter of innocents. Parents wouldn't let their children go out in the streets anymore. Now in custody, it falls to psychologists to assess the character of a man who has readily confessed to committing horrific and callous crimes. My colleagues who carried out the assessment labeled him a perverted psychopath and not fundamentally a pedophile. In the sense that to him, children weren't an exclusive object of lust. They were an object among others. It is soon established that Dutroux's psychopathic nature could have its roots in a turbulent and loveless childhood that saw him turn to petty crime and sell himself to older men for sex in his teens. He's grown up in a, a bit of traditional family nest for, for psychopaths. A very dominant mother, um, very aggressive father, a very egoistic couple, and as a result, a very egoistic young Marc Dutroux. But to fully understand who they're dealing with, investigators speak to Sabine Darden, who has survived 11 weeks in Dutroux's clutches. With her testimony, they start to build a profile of a man whose crimes have shocked the world. After being snatched on her way to school, Sabine was driven to a house in Marcinelle, a suburb of Charleroi, a city in Belgium's decaying industrial heartland. Sabine was drugged by her captor, led upstairs to the first floor, and chained to a bed. She was given an elaborate story by Dutroux, explaining why she had been kidnapped. He explained to her that she had been kidnapped in exchange for a ransom, but that her parents had refused to pay the ransom, and so the people who had ordered the kidnapping had given him the order to execute her. And since he himself was very nice, he had decided to protect her. Tu peux même dire que je t'ai sauvé. 
In exchange for this protection, she should grant him some favors, and everyone understands what that meant. Trapped and alone, Sabine Dardenne was repeatedly raped by her captor, or in his words, her savior. He's someone who likes to hurt. He's someone who likes to practice mental manipulation in all regards. To hurt mentally, to hurt physically. As the weeks passed, Sabine was confined to a specially constructed dungeon, three feet wide and nine feet long. She kept a diary day by day, in which she drew across when Dutroux had come and abused her. One cross meant it hurt. Two crosses meant it hurt badly. Sabine's captor allowed her to write letters, which he promised to send to her parents. I promise to be less selfish and also lend my things, be more helpful, be better tempered. I'm sure you'll find that I've changed. But the letters were never sent. I think the majority of children would have interpreted the lack of rescue as a sign their parents no longer cared about them, because there is a naivety about children. Please think long and hard about what I've said. I can't carry on like this for much longer. But Sabine's testimony also raises big questions. How has Marc Dutroux been able to operate so freely and for so long? Could the police have stopped him sooner? Could lives have been saved? As more chilling details emerge, the world looks on in horror as Belgian society approaches meltdown. In August 1996, 12-year-old Sabine Dardenne and 14-year-old Letitia Delay were rescued from a cellar beneath a dilapidated house in southern Belgium. Letitia had been imprisoned for six days, Sabine for 79. But while they have survived, four other girls have perished at the hands of their captor, Marc Dutroux. Over the next few months, a series of devastating revelations emerge about Dutroux's past and his relationship to the country's authorities. Belgians realize in horror that the police could have arrested him long ago, potentially saving the lives of four young girls. The name of Marc Dutroux was in the file less than two weeks after the disappearance of Julien Melissa. So the police had all the information they could couldn't really dream of. All the conditions to arrest Marc Dutroux were met many months before his actual arrest. The abductions that followed Julie and Melissa's kidnapping could have been avoided. We are absolutely positive that Dutroux could have been arrested. Information comes to light. In 1989, six years before the disappearance of Julie Lejeune and Melissa Rousseau, Dutroux and his wife had been convicted of the abduction and rape of five girls. Dutroux was released just three years into a 13-year sentence. It was completely predictable that this guy would relapse. A time bomb. A powerful time bomb was ticking. From his release in 1992, warning signs were flashing. A police informant claimed he was asked by Dutroux to help him kidnap a girl. Dutroux's own mother even tipped off police that her son may be hiding girls in his home. In 
Eventually, in August 1995, the police put him under surveillance, an operation codenamed Othello. A camera was hidden in a railway wagon in front of his house in Massinelle. This camera was in front of the house the night that uh, Anne and Ephia were kidnapped. The problem was that uh, the crew chose to do this uh, kidnapping uh, at night and the police turned off the camera uh, at 6 o'clock in the evening. Afterwards they tell us that for operational reasons this camera has only been turning from uh, 8 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock in the evening or something. This is very intelligent if you want to catch uh, someone, a pedophile kidnapping girls. The officer in charge of Operation Othello, René Michaud, visited the house in December 1995. Dutroux had recently been questioned about stolen cars, and investigators used this as an opportune moment to search his house. Also present was a locksmith, Alain Lejeune, who was accompanying the police in their search. Qu'est-ce qu'on entend? Il y a des enfants ici? Suddenly, children's voices are heard. You heard these voices and this discussion starts. Did you hear that? No, ce sont des enfants dehors. Oui, ils jouent dehors. Ah non, ce bruit vient de l'intérieur. Écoutez, c'est clair. Silence. Non, et puis, puis c'est qui le policier ici? Allez, on y va. The locksmith said, I heard voices, and it was absolutely clear that they came from there, from two meters from where we, st where we were standing. The voices are Melissa Russo and Julie Lejeune. Three months later, they were dead. Do not forget that this Julie and Melissa disappearance was the top story in Belgium. That was the absolutely the top priority of police, uh, at least that's what they told us. Michaud found video cassettes during his search. They didn't watch the tapes. The explanation afterwards that they didn't have a, a video player. On one of these tapes, we can see Mark Dutroux constructing his, his cage. The explanation of where it was and how it was constructed was, was on tape. They just had to watch it, but they had no video player. There again, that's official version. Sorry, I don't buy it. René Michaud always claimed that the door to the dungeon was so well hidden, it was impossible for him to realize its true significance. A claim backed by other investigators who have been in the house. The space in which the children were confined, it was hard to see, because shelves had been placed in front of the door. There were plenty of boxes, rubbish, everything was stacked. So no one could ever suspect that behind that wall, a cell had been built to hide children in. I cannot conceive of any investigator who wouldn't go all out while looking for a missing girl. Michaud, who died in January 2009, stated that his failure to find the girls haunted him. Others are skeptical. To accept the word incompetence, sorry, there's, there's a limit to what you can consider as being incompetence. The whole of Belgium was searching for the kids. And the Gendarmerie knows Dutroux, with his past as a child abuser. They know he's building suspect hiding places in some of his houses. And yet, for some totally incomprehensible reason, Marc Dutroux wasn't arrested. Belgians begin to ask whether Marc Dutroux is being protected by powerful people within the state. While in custody, Dutroux himself fans the flames of conspiracy with a controversial claim which will forever change the global perception of this case. He states he is part of a national paedophile network whose tentacles stretch right to the top of Belgian society. Investigating judge Jean-Marc Connorot is put in charge of preparing the case against Dutroux. He is determined to get the truth. Connorot arrests known associates of Dutroux. One of these is Michel Nihoul, a well-connected Brussels businessman and pub owner. 
He's a part of this scene of sex parties in, in Brussels in the early 80s. He's the kind of guy telling stories about uh, tapes that allow him to blackmail a minister being involved in some kind of crime. After a public appeal, 11 previous victims of Dutroux come forward. They are known as ex-witnesses, and each is given a code name. X1 is Regina Luf. I saw him on TV and all these people yelling at him, and it was a very strange experience for me. Regina Luf, now a mother of four, recognizes Marc Dutroux and Michel Nihoul from her childhood. <laughs> My mother had a boyfriend and he hired me again to other men to sort of a prostitution network and there I met Nihul. So these parties were organized for other pedophiles and there they uh, took one, two, several children uh, and um, they, uh, well, they, they had sex with them of course or they, they took photographs or films or making movies, everything. People who were going to, to these parties were big businessmen, there were also politicians. Accompanying Nihul at these parties, according to Regina, was Marc Dutroux. If this story is true, Connorot appears to have stumbled upon evidence that a paedophile network involving Dutroux, Nihul and powerful people in Belgian society does indeed exist. It falls to Rudy Hoskins to investigate the claims of Regina Louf. She talked about lots of people, a lot of notorious people in Belgium, could be politicians or people from corporates, stuff like that. Also people from the police. It's difficult to say what her first impression was. It was a young, a young woman with, uh, yeah, with quite some problems, I think, in her head, honestly. Yeah. That they are skeptical, I, I think it's logical. But the only thing I asked from them uh, was to do their job and to, to look for clues. Then Regina Luf provides extensive details of the unsolved murder of 15-year-old Christina Van Hees, whose body was discovered in a disused farm on the outskirts of Brussels in 1984. We found evidence in the old murder file about the autopsy of the corpse that corroborated her story. The way the, the victim was bound with the hands on, on, on the back and uh, all kind of stuff they did to the victim. And there were really things she, she gave in her interview that were not publicly made available at the time of the, of the murders that she, she told us. Regina Loof's information on the Van Hees murder persuades Hoskins that maybe there is some truth in the rest of her testimony. If there's only 10% or 20%, that's worldwide investigating further. It's, I think that's, for me, it's very clear. But the implications of this testimony are also clear. A paedophile network of rich clients and criminals, protected by the authorities. There's a big danger if she's right about the crime, the motives of the crime and the way it has been committed. She might be right about the suspects as well. I think uh, people... In, and some level we're, we're afraid of that, of that. However, Judge Connorot's investigation into Regina Luf's claim of the existence of a powerful paedophile network is suddenly brought to a halt. In October 1996, he is sacked. His attendance at a dinner thrown by the families of Dutroux's victims is deemed a conflict of interest by his superiors in the Ministry of Justice. Rudy Hoskins and the team working with the ex-witnesses are summoned to the Justice Department. We were just informed during that meeting that already as from today you stop your investigation. And that was it. We were going too far for some people. Don't ask me who, I have no idea, and, and why, no idea. I still ask myself the same question, but we touched upon something that was not supposed to get out in the open. Connorot's dismissal 
has a devastating effect on public confidence in the Dutroux investigation. I have been covering criminal investigations in this country for 15 years. I can give you hundreds of names of judges having dinner with victims, with uh, lawyers, of, of, with suspects. This happens all the time. In Konrad, have you... I always believed in Konrad. This stank and still stinks, in my opinion. Hundreds of thousands of Belgians agree. On the 20th of October 1996, national outrage boils over at a huge march organized by the families of Dutroux's victims. There was a sense of total disbelief, a sense of revolt, a sense of, uh, this can't go any further like this. 300,000 people march through Brussels. Workers across the country go on strike and firemen turn their hoses on government buildings to symbolically cleanse official corruption. Belgium stands on the brink of revolution. Meanwhile, the man at the center of the storm maintains he is simply a small player in a much bigger criminal conspiracy. And his surviving victims prepare for their day in court. I didn't crack up when I was freed from the monster's grip at the age of 12. But when I turned 20, another severe test of nerve awaited me, face to face with Marc Dutroux. In 2004, Sabine Dardenne and Letitia Delay attend the trial of the man who held them captive in his dungeon. In the dock with Marc Dutroux are his ex-wife, Michel Martin, and alleged associates, Michel Nihoul and Michel Lelièvre. It has taken eight years to bring Dutroux to trial. Officially, this is because the authorities have had to spend years investigating hundreds of leads into paedophile networks, which the police are convinced don't exist. One thinks the trial will take place in 98, 99. Some dreamers have said 2000. No, well, 2004. Because of all the dead ends the investigation was led into, this whole series of way out leads. Sabine Dardenne was held captive for 79 days in Dutroux's dungeon in 1996. Eight years later, she gets the chance to confront him at last. Dutroux, Dutroux is a pervert. Dutroux, Dutroux is a predator. Dutroux, Dutroux is a monster. She wanted to face him. She wanted to ask him, why on earth didn't you kill me? A question Dutroux didn't deign to answer. But that isn't the only unanswered question to emerge from the trial. Belgians are split over whether Dutroux is a lone predator or part of a paedophile ring run by his co-defendant, Michel Nihoul. I do think it wasn't just Dutroux who killed my child. I think that the police and the judiciary share in the guilt. But many voices who could potentially shed light on this story are not in court, fueling suspicions of a cover-up. There are a lot of people who died in the entourage of Dutroux very quick after he was arrested. José Stepper is a police informer who claims he has explosive information on Dutroux. He dies two days before he is to meet his contact. His family believe he was poisoned. Jean-Paul Tamino is a figure in the Charleroi underground who disappears just as he is supposed to talk to the police. Parts of his body are fished out of the canal on the day of Dutroux's arrest. Francois Reiskins told a friend he'd seen Melissa Rousseau alive in Holland. Before he could tell the police, he was killed on a railway line. In all, 20 people connected with the case had died in suspicious circumstances. Also not appearing is Regina Louf, whose police interviews in 1996 appear to support the existence of a paedophile ring involving rich clients and run by Michel Nihoul. 
But the police investigation into Regina's claims was halted in 1997. We still ask ourselves the same question, why? We were just doing our work, uh, we were objective. Why the hell did they stop us? She was interviewed by a second team of investigators and her testimony dismissed. They said it right in my face that they didn't believe it anymore and that uh, I was uh, sick in the head and that I just only wanted attention. By 2004, Regina Louf's character and testimony are bitterly disputed. Her motives and her state of mind are questioned, and she is dismissed in the press as a pathological liar. Les fantasmes se Fantasies sell better than reality. In the Dutroux case, as far as I can tell, the ex-witnesses don't add anything whatsoever, really nothing whatsoever. It's not that difficult to turn a victim in someone who is crazy. You just point your finger at the victim or the the witness and say she's false, she's just a, a maniac or something like that. In contrast, Letitia Delay and Sabine Dardenne maintain Marc Dutroux was their only abuser. La seule personne vivante. The only living person who has been in Dutroux's claws for 80 days is Sabine Dardenne. Sabine Dardenne dit, and Sabine Dardenne says, the only one I've seen is Marc Dutroux. So where is the ring? Someone who is acting on behalf of a large and very wealthy ring to sell little girls would not carry out a kidnapping in a ramshackle van registered to himself. And then he would keep this product in his cellar but wouldn't throw it on the market for some 80 days. It makes no sense. Dutroux has never offered any details of the network he claimed to serve. It might be helpful if he says, I'm working for an organization, that he would at least give a phone number about the guy, uh, his contact person at his organization. He didn't do that. On the 17th of June 2004, Marc Dutroux is found guilty of the abduction and rape of six girls and killing four of them. He is sentenced to life behind bars. His associate and driver, Michel Lelievre, is found guilty of kidnapping and sentenced to 25 years in jail. Dutroux's ex-wife, Michel Martin, is found guilty of conspiracy to kidnap and sentenced to 30 years in jail. Businessman Michel Nihoul is convicted of drugs offences, but he is acquitted of being an accomplice of Dutroux. Officially, therefore, there is no paedophile network, no powerful clients, and no cover-up by the authorities. The investigation revealed that Marc Dutroux acted alone. We haven't found a single element, neither in the investigation nor afterwards, indicating the existence of a ring, past or present, in our country. But not everyone is satisfied. I think we're never going to get the true story. And I don't believe that there is one person in this country who knows the full story. The questions of whether Marc Dutroux acted alone or if he was part of a larger criminal network, have never been resolved. It's obvious he could have been arrested much early on. It's definite that Julie and Melissa could have been saved and that other later victims could have been saved as well. The question will always be whether that was just bad luck or whether other parameters could have been at work. A Belgian parliamentary report accused the police of ineptitude and inefficiencies, but even such damning findings provide little clarity in a case that almost brought a country to its knees. Previously I said, I want to know the truth. Now I say, I want to get as close as possible to the truth, because we're not allowed to know the truth.